Welcome to this presentation. It will address the focus question, how can nutrition and recovery strategies affect performance, with specific focus on nutritional considerations. A quick look at the syllabus will show us that we need to be focusing on pre-performance nutrition, including carbohydrate loading, during performance nutrition, and post-performance nutrition. And we also need to be aware of the diet requirements of athletes in different sports, considering pre, during and post-performance needs. Now, throughout this presentation, you'll, you'll hear me talk about endurance athletes and other athletes like gymnasts and soccer players, and you'll be able to get a sense of the differences between those sports. A quick overview of nutrients. Now, carbohydrates uh, is commonly uh, believed to be the best nutrient for sports performance. It is the most easily accessible and usable nutrient for the body to break down, metabolize, and create ATP. It doesn't require oxygen to be able to create ATP, so the anaerobic systems can use it, as well as the aerobic system. And it's easily usable. So the body will always choose carbohydrate initially as its uh, first source. Fat is usually considered the second source of fuel. And when carbohydrates are not available, they've been used up, fat is, is the source that will be used. It requires much more oxygen for it to be metabolized. So it takes a little bit longer for it to create ATP. Protein is another source of energy that can be used as a last resort for athletes. Protein is stored in our muscles, uh, in the muscle tissue, and breakdown of protein means breakdown of muscle. Uh, so it's only used as a last resort when carbs and fats are not available. Hydration is, of course, very important. Um, it's important for cooling. It's important for transporting nutrients, maintaining blood volume, and, of course, avoiding dehydration. Now, a quick overview of the idea of fuel for a moment and thinking about how we can make an analogy to a car. Now, cars need fuel, and so does our body. Now, our body needs a blended type of fuel. When we eat our food, we need fats, carbohydrates, and protein. We need lots of carbohydrates, we need quite a bit of fat, and we need quite a bit of protein as well. The body uses, initially, glycogen as its fuel source, which comes from carbohydrate. Glycogen is the stored version of carbohydrate. And the body will always use that initially. It's very usable, creates ATP very easily and doesn't require all that much oxygen to break it down and metabolize it. The second fuel tank is fats or triglycerides, and they are used uh, as the source of fuel when carbohydrates are generally not available or when we're working at really low intensity. So oxygen is required in large amounts to create ATP. Now, when carbs and fats are uh, have been used up, the body may use uh, the muscle protein which in the image you can see it's the infrastructure or the or part of the structure of the body. It's the muscles itself. Uh, so it's not ideal for the muscles to be breaking down and it's only used as a last resort. And the mitochondria, of course, the powerhouse of the cell or the engine in this case, uses the fuel from the three sources to help to generate the ATP that we need to move. Now looking at it from a different angle, an image of the muscle here, so consider glycogen or the stored carbohydrate as the large fuel tank the body draws upon, the triglyceride or the stored lipids or fats as the smaller fuel tank, and the muscle tissue or stored protein as a source of fuel when the other two have run out. Now carbohydrate, we need to think of carbohydrate as providing the energy jump start. Okay, it's, it's used predominantly uh, when our exercise intensity increases between 65 to 85% maximum heart rate. And the body will use it for intense exercise, for endurance exercise. Um, and it requires oxygen, however, it can be used as an energy source without oxygen as well. Fats, consider fats to be the long burning fuel, okay? Uh, at really low intensity exercise, fat is a primary fuel source. Fat gets used quite a bit. As exercise intensity increases, 
the fat use drops away and the body uses carbs just because it's easier and it doesn't require as much oxygen to break it down. Now looking at this graph it clearly shows us that exercise, as exercise intensity increases uh, the amount of fat burned for energy drops considerably and as we increase intensity the green line which is the glucose or the carbohydrate the demand for that fuel increases dramatically because it's the body's preferred fuel. Protein of course is the backup energy and it's only used as an alternative energy source. Um, basically we need protein to help, prepare, to help repair our muscles and it's ideally not used as an energy source but again as a, as a last resort when we don't have any carbohydrates, we don't have any fat the muscle will start to break down. And this is commonly seen when we see images of people uh, in overseas countries that are experiencing famine, their fat has been used, their carbohydrates have been used up, and the body starts to eat away at the muscle to create energy. Pre-performance nutrition. Basically, an athlete will require about 6 to 8 grams per kilogram of body weight or mass um, of carbohydrates to be able to perform uh, effectively in physical activity. Uh, you can see here in this table that as exercise intensity increases the carbohydrate target increases so at light intensity uh, you can see that two to three grams per kilogram of body mass is required moving all the way up to at the competitive level so any competitive athlete should be having six to eight grams per kilogram of body mass uh, per day moderate to low glycemic index is better for sustained release now Basically, we need to consider glycemic index is the speed with which glucose is released into the bloodstream. Now, high GI foods, you can see the example is jelly beans. The glucose is released very rapidly, and the low GI foods released in a much more sustained way. In pre-performance, we need moderate to low GI, so we need a sustained release. You can see in this image, glucose compared with spaghetti. Glucose, obviously, 100% uh, is released into the bloodstream in one hour and you can see that 41% of spaghetti is released into the bloodstream. So spaghetti is a fairly low GI uh, option. Now looking at this table here you can see there are a range of foods, common foods and their glycemic index is listed clearly. You can see that high GI right up in the top right corner, white bread, a very refined type of carbohydrate, a high GI a moderate GI, a wholemeal bread, okay, in the middle there, and a low GI bread, whole grain, multi-grain breads. So breads with grains, low GI. Pre-performance, okay, a meal three to four hours prior to performance needs to be low fat but high carbs, okay, and a good example is a tomato-based pasta, okay, low GI, high in carb provides two to four grams per kilogram of body weight. 30 minutes before, we don't want to eat anything too heavy, so we go for carbohydrate drinks and gels because they provide a quick energy source and they're not going to be too heavy and the body won't need to expend too much energy digesting them. We need to avoid in the lead up to performance high fiber. So in that image there, you've got raisins, figs, prunes, those sorts of foods make you go to the toilet, which is the last thing you need before you go into a performance. And you want to avoid high fat because fat, as mentioned earlier, takes a long time to break down. And as an energy source, it's not a very efficient one. Hydration. We need five to 600 mils of fluid, 30 minutes to one hour prior pre-performance. Now we can choose sports drinks, which will supply electrolytes, and or just simply water pre-performance. Carbohydrate loading is an important strategy to be used by endurance athletes. High intensity endurance athletes uh, will apply this if their event is lasting 90 minutes or over. So a marathon runner will need to carbohydrate load. Now this involves an exercise taper, one to four days, along with a high carb diet of 10 to 12 grams per kilogram of body weight. So basically an exercise taper is, is reducing your amount of exercise in the lead up to your event to save up the carbohydrates so that it can be used during the event. So imagine filling your car up with fuel when you're going away on a long trip for a holiday. You wouldn't go and drive your car around 
and do little trips around the neighbourhood. You would use up all of your fuel if you did that. So in the same way, an exercise taper asks you to fill up your tank with carbohydrates and do minimal running around and training so that the carbs can stay in your muscles and be used. Experts recommend low GI foods, of course, in when you're carbohydrate loading. And you can see there in this image, uh, the low GI foods are the basmati rice, the veggies, the lentils and pasta, the whole grain breads, etc. They're more lower GIs, and you can see those high GI foods should be avoided. A sample menu for a 70 kilogram athlete, you can see throughout, there's a lot of carbohydrate being consumed. Breakfast, snacks, lunch, dinner, and late snacks. It's a carb-rich diet, and it needs to be maintained. Carbohydrate loading is thought to increase muscle glycogen by approximately 50 to 100%, and this improves performance by 2 to 3%. You can see in the graph that an athlete uh, prior to carbohydrate loading, you can see 150 millimoles per kilogram of carbohydrate or glycogen in the muscles. You can see muscle glycogen levels increase dramatically in the blue bar once carbohydrate loading has been implemented. In elite endurance events such as marathon, triathlon, road cycling and long distance swimming, carbohydrate loading can be very beneficial. On the other hand, carbohydrate loading probably not so beneficial for a team sport player because they need to be able to um, train with their team throughout the week. Can't really afford to do an exercise taper. They've got a backup for their game and it's really a little bit more difficult for a team sport. But if you are pre preparing for that long endurance event that's going to last 90 minutes or more, the carb loading will work. Now just a bit more info about tapering. It's a gradual reduction in workout demands. It reduces strain or fatigue muscles and allows the muscles to retain the stored glycogen muscles. You can see the image there, the picture of a person relaxing or laying down. You don't want to totally relax, but it just means a reduction in workout demand, so not training as hard. For it to be effective, for carb loading to be effective, the exercise tape of one to four days is recommended.